Church of Acts, and we're dealing with your favorite topic, persecution and rejection. Yay! Okay. We're in part three, so, <laughs> so this is going to be good, and this yeah. is called Stand Your Ground. Yeah. So John 16, 33. In the world you will have tribulation and distress and suffering. Party time. But be courageous, be confident, be undaunted, be filled with joy. I have overcome the world. My conquest is accomplished, my victory abiding. Okay, so here it is. We will have persecution. Many times, you know, you get this thing of feeling like, well, once you accept Jesus, it's all going to be butterflies and roses from then on. <laughs> Not true, okay? So you will face persecution, but the good news is he gave us a rescue plan. He already defeated the enemy. We get to walk in victory, even though we have to sometimes walk through some hard things, amen? Now, some of you, um, I think it's about 4 to 5% of the population have a personality type that wants to just give me a battle and I am gonna charge right in. They don't like me, who cares? I'm going through. Okay, so Lord bless you that you can handle persecution maybe a little bit better than some of the rest of us who like people to like us, right? So the rest of the 95% of the population actually wants people to maybe like us, maybe get along with us. We, we want peace. We want it just to be, you know, let's just, let's smooth everything over all the time, okay? So I don't know about you, but that's the kind of person I am. I want people to like me, okay? Me too. <laughs> I don't believe that for a heart. <laughs> He's part of the 5%. Okay, so anyhow, so here's the thing is though, is what happens is when persecution and rejection and all of those things come at us, like the Church of Acts, right? Because remember, we are the continuation of the Church of Acts today. And they went through it. My goodness, they were jailed, they were in prison, they were beaten, they had all these horrible things happen to them, um, you know, in the name of their faith. But what it comes is often we want to just find the fastest solution to make it all go away, right? We want people to like us. Man, that's not politically correct. I can't take a stand for that. I can't do that. Man, we're going to do whatever it is the easiest thing to avoid pain. Right? That's many for us. Okay, well, I can't take a stand on social media for that because what if somebody says something? What if this? What if that? And we tend to try to avoid pain. But maybe that's not the end goal. Maybe that's not the right end goal that we should have as children of God and as people who have a divine destiny on our lives to fulfill a God-given purpose. Maybe it's not necessarily supposed to be easy, but we have to learn how to stand up, face the persecution and rejection, and still fulfill our calling despite the persecution. Amen? So that's what we want to talk about because guess what, guys? Stuff is going to come at you. People are going to not like you. People are going to come against you. There's going to be a battle. People are going to say things about you. Man, more than any other year, 2020, it doesn't have to be very far that you look, and you don't have to go very far to find controversy, division, and some things that maybe aren't politically correct. Right? Over all issues this year, it seems like it's really easy to find a battle, fight, you know, to fight. But we've got to find out, God, what do you have to say about this? When people are coming at us, because they will come at you, okay? They will come at you, but how do we deal with that? How do we handle the persecution? How do we handle the rejection that comes up? Because we have got to, as children of God, stop trying to back down from that and take an easy way out. We've got to start standing our ground. We have got to start taking on what God's called us to do. That's why today we're calling it Stand Your Ground. Because there's a, we've got to stop letting temporary pain, temporary rejection, stop us from the permanent purpose that God has for us. Amen. And we have got to learn to push through. Luke 6, 35 and 36, it says, But love your enemies and continue to treat them well. When you lend money, don't despair if you never get paid back, for it is not lost. You will receive a rich reward, and you will be known as true children of the Most High God, having his same nature. For your father is famous for his kindness to heal even the thankless and the cruel. Show mercy and compassion to others, just as your Heavenly Father overflows with mercy and compassion for all of you. Uh, now, I've ever read through Scripture, and you think, man, I just hate that. I mean, I just felt like somebody stepped on my, all of my fingers and all of my toes. Love those people that have been miserable, you know what? Pray for them. 
And they rip me off. Hey, it's okay. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Come on, people. That's not generally our tendency. When people do stuff that are mean, vindictive, that are out to hurt us, we usually have a little different idea. If they get hit by a truck, well, this is what happens, you know. Household accidents happen every day. Some of you even go further and say, well, if they weren't even around, it wouldn't be a big loss. Come on, people, don't give me that righteous church look. Because I watched you cussing them out on social media. <laughs> See, our natural tendency when people do mean things and are persecuting us and vindictive is usually, bless their hearts. Don't worry you stole it from me. It's all good. Now, my wife is really quick to forgive. When people really do bad things to her and really mess with her and really hurt her, she's just really quick to, well, you know, they probably didn't mean that. I'm thinking a little differently. Are you with me? How much pain can we inflict so they get the point never to do that again? Now the problem with that is, God's the whole time we're getting wound up and we get angry, he's going like this. Ralph, what are you doing? John, what are you doing? Mary, what are you doing? Because he says his nature is to forgive. I said, well, that's him. That ain't me. Come on. <laughs> but we're supposed to be like him, think like him, and act like him. Houston, we have a problem. Because my natural tendency is not just to roll over, play dead, and hope it goes away. My natural tendency is to hurt them. Come on, people. Don't give me that righteous, oh, I can't believe the pastor's talking like You did it on the way to church. What are you talking about? Somebody cut you off and you had a bad thought. You didn't say, oh, bless their heart. Look, they, they think I'm number one again. See, what happens is God has taken us on a journey and he says, I need you just to forgive them. I just need you to love them. I need you to pray for them. I need you to be nice to them, even when they steal from you. I'm thinking, well, I don't know. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I'm having a hard time now. I got something in my, <laughs> in my throat. Because that's not a natural tendency, because the flesh is screaming, get them, get them. How many people are here justice people? You've had every button pushed in the last month than you've ever had in your life. And you're lit up like a Christmas tree. I know. But God's saying, I want you to do what? I said, when did they have that in the scriptures? Because I, I, come on. Love your enemies? Treat them well? When they steal from you, don't worry about it. It's all going to be okay. You haven't lost anything. I'm thinking, somebody's delusional and it isn't me. <laughs> Is it true? Yeah. But what God, what's God telling us to do? What's his nature? See, that's where we have to shut off our, do our, give ourselves this time out and say, I better get a check up from the neck up because... Man, my flesh wants to do something way different than what the Bible says. You have to choose. God said, I put before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Choose. Choose. It's not easy to choose because my natural flesh wants to hit them first. I mean, we could run them over with a truck and then forgive them later. <laughs> Keep smiling. It's all good. Because that's what we go through. And God's, God's doing like this to me. What are you doing? That doesn't represent me. That's not who I am. So this is hard. These are hard decisions. Walking in love is probably, a, for me, the hardest thing I've ever had to, try, to do. And it's a constant daily thing for me. Because my flesh wants to rise up when I see injustice. My flesh wants to have it say so. My flesh wants to... I know none of you going through that. I'll just talk about myself for a minute. Because we want to straighten things out. And God's saying, hey, I just need you to, to 
do this. I, I just need you to have my nature and forget about it. Don't worry about it. It's not that big of a deal. <laughs> Come on. We're struggling with it. And this is where a lot of Christians, and I include myself, have missed what God's trying to get us across because it's the love of God that brings people to repentance. It's not beating them over the head with a two-by-four with nails in it. Oh, it's quiet in here. Isn't it true? So we need to take a step into this and say, God, how do I operate in this? Because when I first heard this, this rattled my world. I had to ask myself, am I really born again? See, the Bible says if you hate somebody, you're like a murderer. I said, well, then I've killed a lot of people. Come on, somebody. And no murderer will have anything to do with my kingdom. I'm like, yeah. All right, I don't even, I'm, I've disqualified myself because of my choices. All right, let's keep going. <laughs> so we have to love our enemies. That means loving the person who voted differently than you. It's loving the vote person who oh, has a different, different opinion <laughs> than you. It's loving, the, fighting words. <laughs> it's loving the political figures on the other side of the aisle from you. It, it, it's loving the person who's been attacking you on social media. It's the person, it's loving the family member who is just making your life difficult over and over and over again. It's loving the person who's cheated from you. It's, it, it, it's loving them. It's not giving you us an out. It doesn't give us an out. Um, if they didn't ask for forgiveness. No, it's saying you've got to love them. But I want you to see this. It says love and serve people to life. Love never fails. That's, that's what the scripture says. Scripture says love never fails. I want you to say never. Never. It never fails. It's a supernatural weapon of destruction to the plans of the enemy. It's a supernatural weapon of destruction to the plans of the enemy. When the enemy is trying to destroy your family, when he's trying to destroy your life, wouldn't you love to have a nuclear bomb that goes off and destroys his plan? Yes. yes. That's what love does. Because love never fails. You see, love can't fail. Because it's just like, you know, we talk about tithing and how you give 10% and somehow the 90% goes farther than 100% used to. It doesn't make sense. That's what happens here is our flesh wants its say, but yet God is saying, if you can love your enemy, that's what will destroy the plan of the enemy. That's why we believe so much. It. That's why our mission statement here at the church is to love and serve people to life. Right? Because we understand that love will not fail. Love will not fail me if I love somebody who doesn't love me. It's like a supernatural barrier God puts around us that says, look, if you do it my way, I'll protect you. And the more we make this choice, the more we learn to walk in this, the more we'll start seeing the faithfulness of God. That when you love, you don't lose. Right? Because once again... It's not about our temporary discomfort. We are so caught in, yeah, but do you know what they said about me? Do you know how they messed me up this week? Yeah, but God is saying, but I have an eternal purpose for you. I have something so much bigger than this that if you can tap into what I have, you're going to see some breakthrough. Right? But we're so like this. And we're, we want to hold on to those feelings. We want to hold on to the anger. And God's saying, just love. Because when you love, it destroys the plan of the enemy. Right? It's like a nuclear bomb. So every time when someone comes at you now, when someone says something about you, when they're trying to hurt you, when they're trying to do something, you kind of go, okay, no. I want a nuclear bomb to go off on that assignment against me, so I'm going to love. I'm going to grin, and I'm going to love, and I'm going to start praying. Because here's what Matthew 5 says. However, I say to you, love your enemy. Bless the one who curses you. It doesn't just say like, just love them and don't, don't hurt them. It's just to bless them. Bless them. That's crazy. Bless the one who curses you. Do something wonderful for the one who hates you and respond to the very ones who persecute you by praying for them. Okay, this is not just, hey guys, just don't hurt them. Okay, just leave them alone. This is, no, you actually go on the offensive with love. 
It's like a weapon that will defeat that enemy. And you know what? Praise God, at one point in our lives, Jesus reached out and won us over to him, and we were able to serve him, right? Some of us have got some stories from our past, right? Well, you know what? God wants to reach the person who's persecuting you too. And the Bible says it's the love of God that leads a person to repentance, right? That, that person that is just so deceived or so wrong, if you love them, it actually gives God a chance to pull them in and help them have a Saul to Paul experience, right? What if your prayers for somebody could change it all? And instead of being the thorn in your flesh and the person who's always attacking you, what if they be, get turned around for God and suddenly come alongside of you and you get to do life together? Right? Well, it's quiet in here. It's really quiet in yeah. here. Yeah. That's what happened when I talked on forgiveness in Africa, too. Eee, Not doggy. a yeah. pin drop. <laughs> but guys, there is real breakthrough here. There is real breakthrough when we learn to love and, and to walk in Look at that. Ephesians 6, 12. And this is why this, this is so important. It says, for we, know, we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly places. Now, I want you to see this because we have not been called to fight people. We've been fought, called to take our authority in the spirit world where we have been given the authority. Amen. If you get in the flesh, you will lose every time. The devil's a flesh God and he's real good at it. You'll come out looking like you did something wrong. You'll come out, you'll, you'll, you'll come out being blamed for it, going through all the agony and the pain of it because you're trying to make it right. You're trying to figure out why are these knuckleheads acting so stupid. Come on, people. We have to teach them a lesson. Keep looking ahead. It's okay. And, and the Bible says this. That, that they're not your battle. They're not your enemy. They're being controlled by an evil spirit that's manipulating them to do these things to hurt people. That's right. They've turned themselves over, some of them, to the devil. And the devil's controlling their lives. And that's why they're a train wreck. Uh, you, you show me any person that's gone out with a vindictive mentality to hurt other people. Look at their lives. Look at their kids. They're a train wreck. Their own kids hate them. Wonder why? Because God's not mocked whatsoever. You sow that shall you also. So God say, here's what I need you to do. Don't get into a flesh fight. I want you to go up to the throne room of God where you've been granted authority, where Jesus has opened the door for you that you can come boldly into the throne room of God and obtain mercy and grace and you can go and plead your case with your father. God, what's going on here is wrong. He knows it's wrong. And you've called me to be your ambassador and I'm asking you to show me how that I can love these people because, see, we quit on these people. We've given them up. We want to run them over with the truck. And God's saying, but I'm, I'm, I'm not done with them. Like, there's some souls that are going to get turned into Paul's. And if you run them over with the truck, how am I going to change their hearts? How am I going to change their lives? You just got in and made a mess for me and I make me look bad. <laughs> I was just helping God. You were moving a little too slow. God says, I don't operate that way. God says, go into the heavenly realms and take your authority. We did that whole series on authority. If you missed it, you need to go in and, and re-listen to it. Because when we stand in our authority of what God's called us to do, that's when we'll see the breakthroughs. Amen. The battle is not with the people. It's the spirits behind those people. And the Bible says whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Heaven. So we got to take our authority. So here I want you to see this. Don't ever fight the person. Fight the spirit behind the person. Now this year is a great illustration of that. Too many of us are fighting people in this political divide. We're fighting people over a virus. We're fighting all of these things. But we have to understand that it's the, it's the devil who's actually the one behind it all, 
right? So when it comes to COVID-19, for instance, it is a real virus, but it is not the virus we fight. It is the demonic assignment in that virus that we fight. You see, we have got to start understanding that we're going to get in the flesh and we're going to destroy people and we're going to destroy each other if we try to fight humanly. We have to fight spiritually. It has to be in our prayer place that we're like, in Jesus' name, I bind every assignment of the enemy against my life. That person who's trying to take me down right now, in Jesus' name, I command that assignment broken. You know, we, we sang the song earlier today, no weapon formed against me will prosper. Right? We declare that and we take care of it. We don't have to fight person to person. Because if you go ape hanger on them, I guarantee you, you're going to have some consequences. But Maybe you know not what? good ones either. Just no. Saying. But if you go and you go, no, in Jesus' name, God, I see what the enemy is trying to use that person for, but I will not stand for it. I thank you, God, that your purposes will prevail in my life. You see, we have to fight it in the spiritual realm. Now, God does not require us to be doormats. I want to say thank that. Thank God for Ooh. that. Okay, yeah. because uh, we have to love them, but we also have to have boundaries. Boundaries are good. Too many Christians are passive and think, oh, well, I can, you know, Lord, I just have to walk in love. And we let people walk all over us. But that is not what God wants for his sons and daughters. Okay, we are children of the king. If you went into a king's children and mistreated them, there would be consequences, okay? So he wants us to put boundaries. And I want us to show that in, um, in scripture, in Acts 16. Now, Paul and Silas had been jailed for preaching. They were wrongly imprisoned, uh, they were beaten, and all these things, but I want you to see how they responded. In uh, verse 35, at daybreak, the magistrate sent officers to the prison with orders to tell the jailer, let those two men go. The jailer informed Paul and Silas, the magistrates have sent orders to release you, so you're free to go now. But Paul told the officers, look, They had us beaten in public without a fair trial, and we are Roman citizens. Do you think we're going to just quietly walk away after they threw us in prison and violated all of our rights? Absolutely not. You go back and tell the magistrates that they need to come down here themselves and escort us out. When the officers went back and reported what Paul and Silas had told them, the magistrates were frightened, especially upon hearing that they had beaten two Roman citizens without due process. So they went to the prison and apologized to Paul and Silas, begging them repeatedly, saying, please leave our city. So Paul and Silas left the prison and went back to Lydia's house where they met with the believers and comforted and encouraged them before departing. Now, Now, I just want to say something here. Go ahead. These magistrates basically were hoping these guys would roll over and just go away. Right? Like, just, you know, yeah, sorry, oops, my bad, go away. And how many Christians, when you've been wrong, when something has been done to you, we just, oh, you know, well, thank you, Jesus, love you. You know, and we're to love, but we're also just supposed to stand for our rights and put boundaries in place, which is what they did here. They decided, I'm not going to quietly go away. I'm going to stand for my rights. And guess what? Something's got to be done here, right? That boss who made a fool of you in front of the whole company wrongly and then quietly comes to you and says, oh, yeah, sorry, but that, my bad. Maybe they should give you a public apology in front of the company that they just ditched you in front of. Right? So you understand, it's okay to have these boundaries. You know, I think part of this, we read it over quickly and we, we miss it. These guys were beaten. Can you imagine getting beaten for something you didn't do? Public beating in front of everybody? And they illegally did it? And now they get come up and they're, oh, I'm sorry. I say, give me that stick and I'm going to do it. Come on, somebody. How many you would think would be appropriate for those magistrates to take a whole big licking? Come on, people. Because that would be the right thing to do. Balance the scales. These knuckleheads ought to use half their brain at least before they go out and do something stupid. And, and Saul, Paul, was a mass murderer. So you know that God got a hold of him because he, was, he was just wanted to have an apology. And when he got an apology, he was able to let it go. Are you getting this? Because our natural flesh tendency is, give me that stick. Come on, people. 
Let me make it right. Let me tell you what it feels like to take a whipping. You whipped me for nothing. You didn't even have a legal right to do it. And that, give me the stick. Come on. <laughs> Is it okay for us to have those thoughts? That's a normal thought process you're going to go through. But Paul chose to forgive and to walk in love. It wasn't easy. I bet his blood was boiling. They don't even know what they did to me. They could probably get themselves executed for even beating a Roman citizen. The Roman citizens were like the ruling class. You didn't mess with them. But he chose forgiveness. I said he chose forgiveness. Oh, it's not easy. I, this, none of this is easy lifting stuff. If you're wired to, for, for, to see justice happen, every button, and, and he was a, a justice guy. But something happened because God got a hold of his heart. Yeah. So boundaries are good. We need them. But I want to say, we're going to give you some examples of boundaries, but I want you to say that when you make a boundary, you need to make sure that your heart is free of offense or hate. Okay, many times in the heat of the moment, we put up a boundary that was not a godly boundary. Um, and, and it's going to cause you more harm. So what you need to do is come out of the heat of the moment and just, okay, God, show me how, how do I handle this? How do I, what is a healthy boundary that protects me and what you're trying to do in my life um, that, but, but does not allow them to walk all over me? Okay, so some boundaries, for instance, if you are in a, a marriage and one of the spouses is cheating, um, and there need to be some boundaries. There need to be some boundaries. Maybe you are not able to sleep in the same bed until trust has been rebuilt and until you know there's full repentance. Maybe that the requirement is, look, we're going to go for counseling. And, you know, many times what happens is we can manipulate each other going, well, I thought you were a Christian. Aren't you just supposed to forgive me? Yes. And I forgive, and we give forgiveness, but now there have to be some boundaries while trust is re-earned, okay? Because forgiveness and trust are two different things. Trust is given, trust is earned, right? Forgiven so, is given, trust for, is earned. Yeah, did I say it the other way? Yeah, no, it's oh, okay. Oh, sorry, I'm yeah, forgiveness is out. given, trust is earned. I'm not just here for my good looks with my nice new yeah, shirt. Yeah, you I know, mean. <laughs> everything else. But maybe, maybe a family member is always attacking and... and and ridiculing you or your spouse or a family member. And every Thanksgiving and every Christmas, it's just like they constantly just rail on how bad the other person is. You know what? You need to set a boundary. There needs to be a boundary of, look, I love you, but you will not defile my family, and you will not do that in my home. If you want in my home, you will have to earn trust again. If, that, if you do that, you're not going to be allowed in my home until we have been able to reestablish that you will honor my family, and my spouse, and me in our home. Don't just let a family member come in and rule over your family and change the environment in your home. That is not okay, right? Maybe you have to take a relationship where you're just on phone calls with a family member for a season until they earn that trust back and understand how serious you are about these boundaries. You see, you need to protect what God has given you and what your purpose in your family. Maybe it's someone who constantly needs money from you and they're always asking for money. Don't give it. <laughs> Just say no or make them earn it. Give them an opportunity to work for you to earn that money that they constantly need. Because many times what happens is if we don't put healthy boundaries in, we enable people and God is trying to get them to a place where they'll seek him. And instead, they're looking to you as their source instead of God as their source. And it ends up making a whole worse, the whole thing worse. We need to make sure that, bound, understand that boundaries aren't just for you, but they can also be for the other person because it makes them have maybe get to their come to Jesus moment a little bit faster. Okay. Or how about someone who's gossiping about you all the time? A close friend that just seems to always be talking behind your back. Cut them loose. Love them from a distance. Man, the people that you really share your life with, that you share your deepest heart with, should be a very, very small group. If you're sharing all about your life with 30 people, you got too many people who know your stuff. Okay? You can have lots of friends, but those people that you really trust with your life should be very small, and they should be trustworthy. So maybe some of them are like, you know what? I, I, I just have to distance. I'm going to love you from a distance right now, but I, I just feel like we have to rebuild trust. Okay, those are okay boundaries to have. You know, in that, we must learn how to stand our ground even when we're being persecuted. Hebrews 10, 32 to 36. 
It says, don't you remember those days right after the light shined in your hearts? You endured a great marathon season of suffering and hardships, yet you stood your ground. And at times you were publicly and shamefully mistreated, being persecuted for your faith. Then, uh, then at other times you stood side by side with those who preached the message of hope. You sympathized with those in prison, and when all your belongings were confiscated, you accepted that violation with joy. Convinced that you possess a treasure growing in heaven that could never be taken from you. So you don't lose your bold, courageous faith, for you are destined for a great reward. You need the strength and endurance to reveal the poetry of God's will, and then you will receive the promise in full. So what does this mean? It means you don't have to back down. You may not like what's going on, but you're still going to walk in love. Right now, we're in the middle of this mess. Canada's in the... In, Winnipeg Church can't even be open. The government says, if you get more than X amount of people together, five people or something like that, we're going to go after you and find you. And they even set up a 1-800 squeal number. So if your neighbor's doing something and you want to get them in trouble, you can call. That's what you call communism and socialism. I'm sorry to be that blunt. We have rights as citizens that were given to us by our forefathers in this country and in that country. And it seems to be they trample all over them. You can have a strip club and go do all that kind of stuff, but my God, don't you think going to church, you're going to get somebody infected. Hello, people. Don't shut me down because I'm preaching good now. See, if we're not going to stand, our forefathers fought. I said they fought to give us those civil liberties. They left the tyranny of all the nonsense in Europe, and they came over here, to, and now we're going to roll over and play dead? I don't think so. See, sometimes you got to get a little angry. I didn't say you're going to be in, I didn't say you're going to attack them. I didn't say you're going to go to prayer, but you're going to say, no, we're not backing down. Right. See, there's evil people running things because if it's okay to have a strip club open, but it's not okay to have church open, Houston, we have a problem. Right. Strip clubs don't bring life. They bring debauchery. The church is the answer to the situation. So we need to stand and take our ground and say, no, we're not giving up those rights. We didn't sign for this. No, we're going to push through. Thank God for our governor in Florida. I know he's not perfect. I know he's not perfect, but he gave us the right to assemble and get together because he didn't want to step on our constitution. Some of those other governors, shame on you. Who do you think you are? Come on, people. You hire a government to fulfill the law, not to do whatever they want to do. Well, it's in your best interest. Listen, I'll decide what's in my best interest when I read scripture. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I don't know what everybody else is doing, but I know what I'm doing. Well, you're a radical pastor. And you're Canadian? I said I couldn't live in that country. I would have hurt somebody. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Winnipeg, Canada, take your positions. Don't back down. California, take your positions. All those counties or, the, or those states that are running over your rights, stand up. That's what has to happen. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. You're the answer to all the world's problems because Jesus is still king. So we have to be people that are bold enough to say, no, I'm not backing down. No, 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 no. Come on, people. They don't like that. Don't. I, I think you're too aggressive. You're being unreasonable. I said, well, no, I'm a believer. I said, I'm covered with the blood of Jesus. You don't have to worry about me getting sick or any of that other nonsense. I said, I've been bought and paid for. I said, I read Psalm 91. I said, if you don't know Jesus, I'd throw 10 masks on. I said, you're probably still going to get something. <laughs> if you don't know Jesus, you're going to hell. I mean, there's no point in pulling out. Let's pull all the stops out now. Without him, you're done. With him, all things are possible. Amen. I'm sorry, I better quit before I get in more trouble. <laughs> Psalm 
The scripture says you are destined for a great reward if you stand your ground. Even in the middle of persecution, you can still be in joy when you realize your reward is so much more than anything of earthly value. It's eternal. When you realize that you're going to stand your ground, not just to be right, okay? That is, that is not a reason to stand your ground. We stand our, grind, our ground for righteousness, to, to defend what God says about you, about your life, about the purpose of God on your life. That's why we stand our ground. We don't need to stand our ground to be right. It's irrelevant whether we're right or, you know, in someone else's eyes. We have to do it because of what God says. But not everyone's going to be happy. But you can still have joy in that persecution knowing that you're doing it for a, earth, an, a, a heavenly purpose. You know, not everyone was happy when we did not close our church or when we didn't mandate masks and we are allowing people to make the decision of what they feel is best for them. Not everyone wants to come to church. Many are still doing church at home and we honor you and it's why we increase our online presence and we give things for kids at home because we honor that decision. But we also understand that as a, a, a church, we are a spiritual ER room where people who are hurting need to come. And there is no way that in the worst year of our lives that we could possibly be closed. But not everyone's happy about that. Let me tell you, many people have, have given us their ear on this issue. But we know what God has called us to do. And maybe what he's called us to do isn't what he called somebody else to do, but it's what he called us to do. And we will stand. And when we know it's for his purposes, suddenly the persecution that comes at you doesn't mean as much as it used to. You see, when you understand you're taking a ground, you're taking and standing your ground so that God's will in your life can be fulfilled. That you're not allowing persecution to take you out. Now suddenly, you know that it's about a heavenly perspective. Now, your destiny is not in the persecution. Isn't that good news? Woof. It's not in the chains of the rejection. It's not or it's in the reward of your faithfulness and courage. So understand, you're not going to stay in that place of persecution and rejection forever. It's just a temporary moment, and your permanent moment is what your, your calling for God is. Now, I want you to, to just say that you don't need to carry the load of persecution and rejection because Jesus already paid the price for it. He already paid the price Amen. for it. Now, we're very familiar with the scripture in Isaiah 53 about Jesus paying for our sin and that he brings us forgiveness and that in this church, we talk a lot about healing and so that how he was bruised, you know, for our iniquities and he was wounded. He took the stripes on his back for our physical healing. We know that, but do you know he also paid the price for your rejection and your pain and your hurt? Isaiah 53, he was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with the deepest grief. Many of you have felt that, that deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care, yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. He took all of it. The pain of the rejection that you feel he paid the price so that your heart could be healed. The rejection that plays over and over in your head, maybe from as a child when a parent rejected you or somebody rejected you and that pain is just constantly paying in your head. He paid the price for your healing on Calvary at that cross. He doesn't want you to carry it. He wants you to understand that you are already healed. You just need to receive. You need to surrender those things. But I want you to look at this. We don't need to carry rejection because he became it. We don't need to carry grief. He became it. We don't need to carry being despised. He became it. We don't need to carry troubles. He carried them. So understand, he wants to heal you. He already paid the price for what you're experiencing right now. That was never his plan. His plan is for you to be in peace. That in the middle of the hardest things, when people are coming at you, for you to understand that my, he never intended for my heart to be this hurt. He never intended me to carry the rejection from my childhood. He never intended me to, to do that. But instead, if we can surrender and go, God, man, you have an answer for me. You've already paid the price and let him come in and heal. Part of the great news of this is we do not have to operate in our own strength and nobility. Because look at 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. It says, My grace is always, everybody say always, always, more than enough for you. And my power finds its full expression through your weakness. 
So I celebrate my weakness for when I am weak, I sense more deeply the mighty power of Christ living in me. So I am not defeated by my weakness, but delight, but delighted. For when I feel my weakness and endure mistreatment, when I'm surrounded with troubles on every, um, every side and face persecution because of my love of Christ, I am made yet stronger for my weakness becomes a portal to God's power. See, God said he'll never leave you or forsake you. He says, you're never going to be on your own. He says, if they mess with you, they mess with me. Did you get that? He lives inside of you. If you've made Jesus the Lord of your life, he lives inside of you. They're not just attacking you. They're messing with him. And his power can operate through you when you and I stay yielded in him. When we decide not to take on a fist fight and try to figure this out in the natural, when we want to have our own remedies, but when we go to the throne room of God and we pray, we can still take our stand and say no in love. Come on, people. God can be glorified through that. See, if if we don't stand for anything, we'll, we'll fall for everything. Let me say that again. If you don't stand for something, you're going to fall for everything. So you have to make a determination. What did the Bible say about me? What is God saying about me? What are the promises God made for me? That's why it's so important to understand and know that. It's not good enough the pastor knows it. You need to know it. Because when you're in the middle of hell and it's 3 o'clock in the morning on a Thursday night, you don't, you can't call the pastor. He's not going to take your phone call. Come on, people. Hang on, let me just call my pastor. It's 3 in the morning. No, you got to know that you know that you know. Study to show yourself approved so that you know how to operate in this. Because his power will be released. I said his power. His power. You mess with me, you mess with God. His power. He's got a big stick. Are you getting this? You're not been left alone and oh well you're gonna they're gonna mock you, they're gonna call you names, they might even steal stuff from you, they might do all of this, but God says, Don't worry, I'm gonna straighten things out for you. What's the essential part? Make sure you have a relationship with God. If you don't have Jesus living in your in your heart, you're in trouble. Especially in these days. Heaven's not your home. The other alternative's not so good. So this is essential for us to make sure that our lives are right with him, that we're serving him, and that we're walking with him because that's where all of his protection in his kingdom comes. It doesn't matter what's going. The Bible says you're in this world, but you're not of this world. You have a different kingdom system that you operate, and when we operate in that, we get his results. I was very angry, if I can be honest with you, watching these billionaires manipulating everything, and I'm like, these miserable, come on. I'm going through it because I'm watching them screw with the elections. I'm watching them pay people off. I'm watching this corruption and I'm just getting mad. I'm like, and they're controlling the media. They're doing everything. Finally, the Lord says, does one of these to me. Come on, somebody. He, he says, I did, I did change Saul to Paul. He says, if you pray for them, he says, I can get involved in their life. But he says, if you go the other way, you're on your own. I'm not going to participate with the others. I'm only going to participate when you go to the throne room and you, you, you demand, come on, you demand something to happen. You, this, you see, this is a powerful church, a powerful church that knows how to pray, that knows how to take their authority. And when you and I step into that, that's when we start to see the miracles. If God did it before and he's the same yesterday, today, forever, he can do it to those billionaires. Let's start praying for them, church you're here right now and you don't know Jesus or you're online and you don't have a relationship with him I'm going to pray a prayer I'm going to ask you to repeat it after me this is crucial this is life changing stuff we don't take this lightly God's serious about it if you're serious about it he says if you pray with your mouth and believe in your heart and ask him to come into your life he'll radically change your life you got to make that decision I'm going to ask him to bow their heads and if you're here and you don't know him, pray this prayer. If you're online, say it wherever you are out loud. The prayer goes like this. Father, in Jesus' name. Father, in Jesus' I name. I ask that you'd forgive me. I ask that you'd forgive me. Come into my life. Come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Be my Savior. And help me to live for you. And help me to live for you. Every day of my life. 
every day of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.